Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Lisa Blackburn, and this is my YouTube channel for everything I talk about science and math. And today we are in chemistry class talking about heat. And uh, before we start, I want to tell you about your assignment, which is this, which I meant to tell you about on Friday, which is a food diary. So what I want you to do is I want you to take out a piece of paper and write down everything you have eaten or drank this morning other than water. So for three days, we're going to write down everything that we eat or drink. And it will be a heavy formative or maybe even a summative because it's a pain to write down everything you eat or drink for three days. And uh, then we're going to do calculations with it. We're going to analyze your, your diet. Um, you're going to do it. I'm not going to. You're going to do calculations and compare your diet to the U.S. recommended daily allowances. Hold on. Yeah. So write it all down, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, and let's start it right now. So you're going to do that today, you're going to do it tomorrow, and you're going to do it Wednesday, and we'll do our calculations on Thursday. Yes. All day. But today, everything, you've started a day. It's early enough in the day you can remember what you ate. So write it down and then just keep it up. Everything you eat, everything you drink. And don't like diet or anything like that. Just try to make it your regular what you eat. If you eat a Snickers every morning for breakfast, write down that Snickers. Nobody's going to be judging your diet but you. So, um, don't, so be truthful. Don't lie about it. <laughs> write down what you eat. Okay, so, I, so a long time ago, I did this with um, my students, and at that time, I was a vegetarian. I wasn't vegan. I ate um, eggs, and I ate cheese, milk, stuff like that, but I was a vegetarian, had been for a while, and I was pregnant with my oldest child, and um, I did my diet well, along with them, and of all the kids in the classroom, mine was the worst. I was a terrible vegetarian. I did, to be a good vegetarian or vegan, you have to be really good about getting balanced proteins. And I didn't, I just didn't eat meat. And I did, other than that, I didn't really monitor my diet. But as, as far as protein goes, if you're a vegetarian or a vegan, you can't just eat plant-based food. You've got to make sure that you're getting complete proteins. And I wasn't, and I analyzed my diet, and it was terrible, and I was pregnant, and all my students started yelling at me, this black bird, you're starving your baby. So I called up my husband that night, and I said, we got to start eating meat again. We're no good at being vegetarians. And he was like, can we go get Whoppers? And I was like, Sure. So went from vegetarian to eating a Whopper. I think it made us both sick, but uh, <laughs> but it was great. And and we haven't ever been vegetarians again because we're no good at it. Yes. Oh, I was gonna ask you if it made, if it, like, if it made you sick. Yeah. And see, how, what the reason why we started being vegetarians is he was he was in a band and he would travel all over the world playing. And before they play, the the people the promoters would feed them. And they would feed them really heavy food a lot of times. And, um, and like um, rare beef, stuff like that. And that is not good to eat before you go perform. And so he just started writing on his writers. It's a paper you have that you write what you want as an artist, that he was a vegetarian. And so that, that forced them to give him lighter food. Well, once you start being vegan or vegetarian, you can't just go off in a snap and, um, or it'll make you sick. And so you have to kind of ease back into it. And so then once he was vegetarian on the road, then we kind of had to be vegetarian at home. And if he was going to be vegetarian, then I'd be vegetarian. So we were just vegetarians for a while. We weren't like animal rights activists or anything like that. We just did it. It really started because of him being a, a traveling musician. So anyway, that we ended that. Haven't gone back. We've eaten meat ever since. For a, for a long time, um, though, after we had been vegetarians, it's, it was instead of like, we wouldn't eat like heavy meat, we used it more like for flavoring. So like I'd use one pound of ground beef for the whole family in a casserole or something. So it wasn't much meat, but um, 
but and we're still not like don't eat real we we do still i still have my vegetarian cookbooks that i love there was one called the moosewood cookbook which is my favorite we ate everything out of that and I, we still cook out of that cookbook because those are just some of my favorite recipes but um but we don't we're not vegetarians anymore and it was because of this assignment <laughs> it was this assignment that, that did it for me so anyway um heat where you get the energy to make you not room temperature is your food your energy comes from food so food is related to heat as you're gonna learn and so we're gonna you know, so for a nice little practical lab we are going to do a food diet a, a, a food diary your diet analysis. All right, so now let's talk about the notes. So which has more heat? A teacup of boiling water or at Lake Alatuna at 60 degrees Fahrenheit? We know it's Lake Alatuna. I didn't say temperature. Temperature and heat are not the same thing. So that's why it's confusing. Okay, so what is heat? Heat is the total amount of energy the kid, and it can, he can be transferred and it goes from high temperature to lower temperature. Um, and it's measured usually in this class in joules. We're also gonna talk about how we measure heat in calories. See, I told you there was a food connection. Um, so uh, this is, I don't know if we're gonna talk about here. I'll talk about here anyway. Um, so heat, comes from the vibrations of the molecules and the average kinetic energy of the molecules moving is the temperature, but um, heat comes from that. It comes from the energy stored in the bonds. It comes from the molecular motion of the atoms. So heat exists. It's a thing, it is energy, but cold doesn't exist. Cold is just a lack of heat. And a long time ago when I taught in Cobb County, there was this one student that I taught him ninth grade physical science, 10th grade biology, 11th grade chemistry, and 12th grade physics. Taught him for four years. And all four years in different classes, we would talk about this concept, starting in physical science, and then going for chemistry and physics too. And I would tell him that cold doesn't exist. And he was just country and he'd go, no, Miss Blackburn, that ain't so. Cold exists because I can feel it. <laughs> and he said that when he was in ninth grade, he said it in 11th grade, he said it in 12th grade. I never could convince him that cold doesn't exist. It's just a lack of heat. So, no, Miss Blackburn, that ain't so. So anyway, cold does not exist. It's a lack of heat. Maybe I can convince you. I can't convince him. No, because I can feel it. Okay, so what is temperature and how is it different than heat? Temperature is the average kinetic energy. Remember, kinetic means motion. If you remember your eighth grade physical science, it's the energy of motion. It's the average kinetic energy. Remember, big E is energy. And it's measured in degrees Celsius or Kelvin in science class. Oh, uh, what do we measure it in in English? Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. So we'll we'll give our little nod to Fahrenheit, a little F there for Fahrenheit. Uh, Kelvin does not have degrees. Celsius has degrees and Fahrenheit has degrees, but Kelvin doesn't have degrees. You just say the number. Okay, and it takes energy, our next idea, to go through phase change. So phases are the states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. And to go from one to another, it takes energy. So I have a little graph here. Uh, let me try this. Don't let me scroll. Oh, look at that. Okay, can I scroll up? Are y'all good? Okay, I'm scrolling up. <laughs> All right, so I have a little gra gra graph here. And this shows temperature rising on this side and energy on this side. And you should have it in your notes. But as you go, so, and so this is good, let's look at this as water, okay? So down here, what do we call solid water? This is a trick question, ice. Okay, here we have ice. Liquid water, we just call water, usually, right? And then gas, we call, starts with an S, steam. 
Y'all must be sleepy this morning. Yeah, your coffee's not written on your list, right, yet, or, or a Coke. <laughs> or a monster. All right. So, here we have ice. Here we have water. Here we have steam. Notice, as it goes through phase change, the line is flat. That as it goes through phase change, the, even though energy is being added to it, the temperature doesn't go up. Everybody see that? Same thing as it's changing from liquid to steam. Even though energy is added, the temperature doesn't go up. What's happening is all the energy that's being added is being used to, go th to make it go through phase change. So here, the energy is being used to break the ice out of its crystal lattice so it can be water. Here, all the energy is being used to break those little bonds. They're not real bonds. Remember when we learned about hydrogen bonding? That, uh, that there is intermolecular forces that are sticking the water together. You know that because it beads up on your finger, makes raindrops, and those forces have to be overcome so that the water is free to be gas. So the whole time that ice is melting, it's zero degrees Celsius. It's until it, every bit of ice melts, and then it'll start warming up. If water is boiling, it is 100 degrees Celsius till every bit of water has been turned into a gas, and then it'll start heating up. Any questions about those ideas? Okay, so when you add heat and the temperature doesn't change, it's only being used to overcome the forces. It has a special name, and it's called latent heat. Come on. Latent heat. And that's where it is during phase change. When you heat it up and it actually changes temperatures, that's called sensible heat, which I think is kind of funny. It's so sensible. You add heat and it heats up. Sensible heat. And so that is here where you add the heat and it goes up. So you're just like on the last test, you had your activation energy diagram. This diagram is going to be on your next test. So make sure you learn it. That was the easiest questions on the last test, that diagram, because I told you this diagram is going to be on the test. This diagram will be on the test. Okay. So the, the takeaway here is that temperature doesn't, does not change, does not change when phase change is happening. And that's called latent heat. And temperature does change when it's not in phase change, and that's sensible heat. Okay. Um, do you have on your notes next melting and boiling occur at specific temperatures? Or do you have this, energy in, energy out? We have that too. You have that too? Because this is a little different than what I have. You don't have melting and boiling in current specific temperatures. Next. I think this is just endothermic, exothermic. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> so endothermic. I don't know why it's different than else. I have different versions of this because if I'm running out of time, I combine. Oh, I meant to show you our standards. We have a new standard, yay. We have two standards left, five and six. And each of the last two standards are broken in half. So we have four units. This is unit eight, the first half of standard five. And then unit nine is the second half of standard five, which is gas. And if I'm running out of time, I do heat and gas together. But we're not running out of time. We're doing great. So we're going to have this week, we're going to have heat. Next week, we'll study gas. And then we have solutions and pH. And then you're out for the summer. 
Okay, endothermic and then exothermic is giving off heat. And y'all already know that. Energy out. Okay, so melting and boiling occur at specific temperatures. So I already told you, water melts at what temperature? Ice melts at what temperature? In Celsius. No, not, that's, that's boiling. What's melting? Zero. So at zero degrees Celsius, and then in English is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's kind of nice to, we normally use English for temperature, Celsius in the lab, but it's nice to know what it is in English too. What temperature does water boil at? 100 degrees Celsius, but we don't usually use Celsius in real life. What is it in Fahrenheit? 212, yes. You can check in. All right. Uh, notes and worksheets for this unit are over there. So you, it's good to know that, that 212 Fahrenheit is, bo is boiling. Now, what about subliming? Do y'all know what subliming is? It sounds like it's a donut place in Austell, isn't it? Sublime Donuts? No, it's downtown by Georgia Tech. I didn't think they were very good. They were supposed to be great. They gave me a headache. Okay. <laughs> Had something artificial in it. Gave me a headache. So what is subliming besides donuts? You might know what that is. What has to do with phase change? It's when, have you ever seen ice go away without melting? It just evaporates. You ever seen that? We live in the South, so we don't have snow very often according to the news, the weatherman, he said we have snow on average of any real accumulation once every two years. So sometimes it goes longer than that before we have snow. So we have not had those opportunities, the people who live up north, to see all different kinds of snow. Wet snow, uh, icy snow, you know, things of dry snow. We're just like, oh, yay, it snowed. Okay, so sometimes, it's happened a few times in my life, uh, it will snow and never melt. The snow just goes away. And I remember one time as a kid, I was public schooled like you, and we had snow days. And unlike poor you, on snow days, we got off. We didn't have any digital days where your teacher is trying to send you work while you're trying to play in the snow. I feel sorry for you. You need to have snow days. It's part of being a kid. But we had snow days back in the good old days before digital learning. And one time it snowed really big on Saturday, huge snow. And I checked the weather and it was not gonna warm up. So I knew we were not gonna have school on Monday because the snow couldn't melt. So did I study for my test on Monday? No, I was counting on snow day on Monday. Got up Monday morning, all the snow was gone. It had never warmed up. Uh, it had just sublimed. Snow can go straight, and other, other solids too, can go straight from solid to the gas form, and that's called subliming or sublimation. And that was very disappointing what happened. No snow day. Okay, so subliming well, doesn't have a temperature that happens at. It depends. It depends on the dryness of the air. It depends on pressure. So it just, it depends. And we're gonna, one of your worksheets has to do with that. The last worksheet I gave you has to do with the conditions of phase change and how it can be different depending on pressure. Okay, any questions about this so far? This is easy, isn't it? Chemistry is gonna get easier and easier as we keep going on. Okay. Okay, uh, uh, uh. now the next thing is specific heat. Specific heat is a physical property of a substance. You can look it up in tables. It's the amount of energy needed to change the temperature of one gram of substance one degree Celsius. You need to memorize that definition. It's an important little chemistry definition to know what specific heat is. Now, what does that mean? Okay, so you're already familiar with this concept, especially if you unload the dishwasher. 
Ever done that? Especially right after the dishwasher got through its cycle and the dishes are hot. You open the dishwasher and you reach in there and not everything, even though every single one of those dishes had gone through the same cycle, had been hit by the same water and the same heat that was the same temperature, you go in there to take them out and they are not all the same temperature and some of them will burn your hand if you grab it, right? Okay, so let's imagine the dishwasher. We reach in and grab <coughs> the plastic cup that we got at the movies, the Thor cup. Gonna burn our hand or not? Thor cup, no, okay, we're good on that one. Glass, it is a glass, a nice thick glass. You reach in to grab it. Is it gonna burn your hand or not? Yes, so solid glass is gonna still be hot. How about wooden spoon? Is it gonna burn us? No, wooden spoon. Knife? Maybe, especially if the knife has the real heavy plastic handles, those real dense ones, those plastic handles might burn us. How about the aluminum cookie sheet? Is it going to burn us? Depends on how thin it is. If it's a pretty thin cookie sheet, it's going to cool off pretty quick. How about the big fat ceramic crock, the ceramic plate? How hot is that one? It's hot, right? It holds that heat, doesn't it? Okay, so, but you know, whether, whether yours is hot or cold, you know that all those dishes are not the same temperature, okay? And it is this idea. It is this physical property that comes from the, the molecules, and it is different from different for different things. And in everyday language, what specific heat is, is if something has a high specific heat, it takes a long time to heat it up and a long time to cool off. If something has a low specific heat, it heats up very quickly, but it also cools off quickly. So, um, uh, so the things that are cool very quickly that we can touch in the dishwasher have a low specific heat. The things that are still hot in the dishwasher have a high specific heat. Got that in your head? Okay. So. The symbol for specific heat, let me go over here. Okay, so uh, it's C is for the constant, it's lowercase, lowercase c. Now, which one cools off first, water or aluminum? Which one do you think? Okay, so let's think about it. You got a pot of water on the stove. You heated it up to boiling. You have another pot on the stove that's empty that you had the heat on, and then, because you were going to make something in that pan. You were going to fry an egg in that pan. It, it, but it's a little aluminum pan. Identical aluminum pans. One has had boiling water in it. The other one you turned on the, the heat for, went to the refrigerator, and you wanted it to preheat because you wanted your egg to go and sizzle as you dropped it in there. But you open your refrigerator, no eggs, you come back over and turn off the water. You also turn off your boiling water. You walk around for 10 minutes. Which one could you put your hand and touch the bottom of after 10 minutes without getting burned? The aluminum pan? or the with this empty, or which one's safer to touch? The empty aluminum pan that's been sitting there 10 minutes, or the one that's got water in it? The empty one. So which one cools off first? The aluminum. And the reason why is because water has a high specific heat, and aluminum has a low specific heat. Now why does, I told you it has to do with the molecular structure of the atoms, why does water have a high specific heat? It has to do with this, Mickey Mouse, or unimpressed Kermit the Frog. Um, it's because the oxygen is negative in water and the hydrogens are positive. So what do opposites do? Attract or repel? Attract. So it sticks together. Water, molecule, water is a sticky molecule. You don't think of it as sticky, but it is. It sticks to itself. And so therefore, it sticks to itself so hard that it stores that heat energy. It's that, that, is, that polarity, that positive and negative end, is what makes it 
have a high specific heat. Okay, so why water is shaped like I'm gonna say Mickey Mouse. M I C K E Y. M O U S E. Okay, and it is said to be polar. Polar means it has ends to it. It's not the same all over. It's got a positive end and a negative end, just like our Earth has a north end and a south end, a north pole and a south pole, right? Our Earth has ends, uh, water. So it sticks to itself. Okay, so the next idea is we have a fancy word for heat. We call it heat, but we also call have another word for heat. It is enthalpy. This almost sounds like em empathy, like it's, it's, it's like feeling your feelings, but no, it's enthalpy, it's heat, okay? So that's, so we're going to learn a couple of words. We're going to learn enthalpy, heat, and entropy, which we'll talk about in a second. Okay, so the change of heat formula. Okay, so here are our spoons here. There's our wooden spoon and our metal spoon. They would have different specific heats. Okay, so sometimes you see lowercase q, uppercase q, or uppercase H stand for heat. The reason why is we have parts of chemistry and physics that overlap. The chemists say heat is theirs, and we do math, uh, we do this formula, and physicists say, oh no, heat is ours, and they do math on this formula. And so sometimes the two branches of science diverge, and we end up having different symbols for the same thing. So this is one of them. But so heat is either H, Q, little Q, or big Q. M stands for the mass. C is the specific heat. And remember, it's, it is a property, and you can look it up in tables. So water is 4.180 joules or one calorie. I told it's joules per gram degree Celsius or calorie. Notice this calorie is a lowercase c. We're going to talk about that in a second. And T stands for temperature. And temperature we do in Celsius. Any questions so far? Still easy, right? Easy little math problem. Now, how you can remember this math problem formula is it looks like it says heat equals mm cat. You see that? Mm cat. So heat is mm cat. It's really, that's not really an A, it's a delta. Heat equals the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature. But it looks like mm cat. All right, oh, I'm going to roll. I think I could do it here if I do this first. Let's see if this continues to work. It was working last time. All right. And delta is change or difference. You've learned that in here. Okay, so here is an example math problem, and the, math, and the test will be similar to the last one. There'll be a multiple choice part and a math part. So this is what the math looks like. So what do we do with a word problem? We get rid of the, what makes a word problem hard? The word, so what do we want to get rid of? The word, so we want to annotate it as we read the problem. Do this next year in physics too. You drink. A thousand grams, that's a mass, of ice water at zero degrees Celsius, that's the temperature. It warms to 37 degrees Celsius. So there's a temperature and there's another temperature, T1, T2. What is the change of heat? So our question mark is change of heat equals question mark. Oh, you change of heat, I said that. All right, so, uh, so I've, I've labeled my knowns and unknowns. And the other thing that was important there was that it's water, because that's where I'm going to get my C. I have to know what substance it is, so I know what its C is if it doesn't give it to me in the problem. Okay, so here's my formula, H equals MC delta T. The mass is 1,000. The specific heat of water is 4.180, and the change in temperature was 37 minus 0 is 37. You multiply them all together, and I got one, five, four, six, oh, oh, joules. Okay, that's easy, isn't it? So, so it's not always heat that's missing. Sometimes it's one of the other variables, simple algebra solving for x. Not bad at all. Way easier than some of the math that we've done. 
Now, that's what your worksheets are on, and you will probably get time to start them today, but then you'll continue working on that on your digital day tomorrow. Yes? <coughs> that is the specific heat of water, and I gave it to you right there. Oh. You see, and it will either be given in the problem, unless it's water, and they expect you to memorize those. Okay, so that's something you're, but I'd write it on my cheat sheet. Okay. Then you don't have to memorize it. Okay, how do we measure this? So like one of the ways you see if you buy your Snicker bar, it says on it that there are 240 calories in a Snicker bar. Where did they get that number? That's the heat. That's the energy in that Snicker bar. Where did they get it from? Well, they use a device called a calorimeter. A calorimeter. Now, a real one is all fancy like this. This is called a bomb calorimeter. That sounds cool. But it's this thing that you put inside it, what you want to find the heat of it, and then usually it's surrounded by water and it measures it. But we don't use, in high school chemistry lab, these fancy ones. We use this one. I'm not touch that again. We use that one, which is a styrofoam cup. So we're going to do a lab with a calorimeter. Now, I, because of the supply chain shortages, I could not find styrofoam cups anywhere um, last semester. So we used a styrofoam bowl with a paper plate for a lid. It worked actually very good. But if I can find some styrofoam cups, uh, we'll, we'll use a cup. If not, we will use a bowl with a lid. It works. All right, but that's, we'll be doing some labs on Thursday and Friday, uh, Thursday, Wednesday and Thursday. But then we're going to, um, uh, we will do the test on Friday. Let's go. I'll leave it right there. See, let's go back here a second. Let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Not much. Okay. Now, what about units? Let's see where I got to. Okay, there was our cut. He can be measured in joules. We already said that. Or calories. <coughs> Now, let's talk about, this actually, I did that wrong. Let's see if I can fix it. I can, uh-huh. Okay, so remember I told you there's a difference in big C and little c? Little c is the science way to measure <laughs> calories, okay? And it's a little c and it's a unit of heat. But on your food, you will notice that it's big C. It'll say the number of calories in big C, okay? The reason why, well, I don't really know the why. I speculate the reason why, is that big C calories are kilocalories. Little C calories are regular calories, the amount of heat needed to raise one gram of substance one degree Celsius. But this is 1,000 calories. It, so they report food calories like this. If they didn't, the calories that it would say on your Snickers bar would not be 240 calories. It would be 240,000 calories. And I think it's the people who make the food. They don't want people to go, 240,000 calories? I'm not eating that. They want you to go, 240? Eh, I can eat that. Okay, but I, I could be wrong about that. But food calories are actually kilocalories and they're big C. Physics calories or chemistry calories are little c. Okay, so we already said one, one physics calorie with a little c is, it's actually 4.184. Sometimes you see it 4.180, they're rounding it. Um, any of those will work. Okay, and this is it. One food calorie equals 1,000 science calories. Now, our next idea is entropy. The symbol for entropy is delta S, big S, and it is the measure of the degree of disorder in a system. 
the degree of disorder in the system. And it's a law. It's a law of entropy. Okay, let's go back. Which one wins in rock, paper, scissors of science, a law or a theory? Who beats? A law. Laws are so true, they're math. The law of gravity has a number with it the and a formula. Lots of... But the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. So laws beat theories. Theories are evolving. Theories change as we learn more about them. It's not that theories get to be laws when they grow up. Theories are things that just we're always going to learn more about, like the atomic theory of matter. Is it true that, that uh, things are made out of atoms? Yes. Is there more that we can learn about that? Yes. You understand? And when Dalton made the atomic theory of matter, it's changed since then. He said that atoms were, um, could not be broken down any further. He was right that they can't be broken down further and retain their properties, but he thought they couldn't be broken down at all. But now we know about protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now we know way more than that. We know about subatomic particles like mesons and stuff like that, gluons. There's all, and I think you're going to get to learn about those in physics next year. If not, it'll be, it might be college physics. All right, so this is the law. Entropy always goes from more order to less order unless acted upon by an outside force. So things go from more order to less order naturally. They don't go from less order to more order unless acted upon by an outside force. Do you follow that? That's true in your everyday life, right? The reason why we thought it was so cool when we saw Mary Poppins that the room cleaned up itself is because rooms don't clean up themselves, do they? They don't go from disorder, messy room, to ordered, ordered room unless Mary Poppins and her magic bag are there, right? So my example of that is this. So at Six Flags, I've been going to Six Flags since I was a little kid, and when Six Flags was first started, they tried a little harder to compete with Disney, and they tried to have a little bit of imagineering to them. So the Dahlonega ride, you know, the Dahlonega mine train, was supposed to be a runaway mine train from the gold rush in Dahlonega. The first gold rush in America was the gold rush in Dahlonega. Gold was first discovered right here in Paulding County, as, as they will tell you in the uh, the gold museum, but there was no rush. The, the Indians owned it at that time. Nobody rushed to try to come get it. But the first gold rush was in Dahlonega, okay? So, so they had little covered wagons because people went to Dahlonega in covered wagons and they went and they mined the mountains up there. And there's a real good museum if you want to go. It's in the square of Dahlonega, the old courthouse. They've turned into a gold museum. Very interesting. You can see all of this. But back to Six Flags, okay? So imagine a long time there was imaginary. There were little barrels sitting around with like that they marked to make it look like TNT for blowing up the mountains and finding the gold. And they had covered wagons. And so they went so back when I was a little kid, as you went around the little track, uh, there were covered wagons there with little barrels of what was supposed to be like gunpowder in them. Okay, but then over time, the, uh, the first thing that went was, and I love Six Flags, get my season pass every year. I've already got it for this year. I'm ready to go. Whitewater slightly better, but still love Six Flags. So I will be there this summer. But, uh, but I even went during the COVID, I wore the mask and almost died. I remember sitting there on the, um, the, uh, the hurricane one thinking, I am going to die of heat stroke. This mask is suffocating me. I'm going to just faint right here on the platform. But I didn't. I lived, lived through the COVID year. So anyway, we're back to this. So it, when I was a kid, it was a, a cute little imagineered prop. Then over time, the first thing that went was the cover on the covered wagon. Then the wheels broke down. And so it still looked kind of like a abandoned mine, like something was going on there. Finally, all the wood rotted off of it, and it was just the chassis. And now I went, yes, I had to go for Fright Fest, had to go for a holiday in the park, and had to ride it. And now it is just some pieces of metal. <laughs> 
<laughs> rusted, laying out there, ready to give you tetanus and get cut on them. But it is still out there. And I just laugh at that. But it is a terrific example of entropy. Did anybody go out there and tear up that covered wagon? No. They set it up and nobody touched it ever again in all of Six Flags history. So it just on its own, it became this rusty chassis laying out there by the Dahlonega mine train. Unless it is acted upon by an outside force, it's not going to go back to being a beautiful little covered wagon, will it? No. So that is the idea of entropy. It always goes from more to less unless acted upon by an outside force. So in chemistry, you have an explosion uh, and things are becoming more disordered. Is it going to go back to being ordered again without being acted upon at by an outside force? No, there's always got to be a force. And in general, this is a law that is also called the second law of thermodynamics, but it applies to the whole universe. The universe is moving from order to disorder. Things are becoming more disordered as time goes on, as the universe is sort of winding down and becoming more disordered. Now, there is a problem. Sometimes science, we're discovering something over here and we're discovering something else over there. And sometimes science conflicts with itself. Not to worry. This is actually a good thing. It means that we don't know it all. It'd be boring if we knew it all. Remember in our video when the lady said, whoops, everything's made out of hydrogen. We don't understand this. It makes it appear like everything's young and pristine. That's okay. We just don't know everything. It'd be boring if we knew everything. And if everything had already been discovered and we knew it all. Okay, so this is another area like that hydrogen we talked about. And it's, we have two theories in science that contradict the law of entropy. What are they? What contradicts this? Then we have two. Two big theories, big, big theories, and very, very major. Yes. Um, there's something more basic than that. You're thinking too deep. Not that. Something more uh, first than that. What? I feel like I'm going to be wrong. Go for it. That's what we do in science. We're wrong. It, be free to be wrong. It's awesome. Is it really, like, popular? Like yes. Evolution? And? There's two. She got one. Evolution. What's the other one? Big Bang. Let's talk about Big Bang first. Had she said Big Bang? Okay, what is the theory of Big Bang? It was that, and we've talked about it in here before, that everything in the universe started off as a baseball size thing of matter that exploded and out of it came all the planets and galaxies and everything out there came from an explosion. Do you see how that violates this law? Things don't go from disorder and explosion to order. Beautiful, the earth. Think how cool the earth is with the whole hydrologic cycle and the tides and the, and the seasons and just the amazing system of order that is the earth. That that could have come from an explosion it violates the second law of thermodynamics. It violates the law of entropy. The law says it cannot happen unless acted upon by an outside force. So, Scientists come up with some ideas. Maybe some aliens did it. Maybe there are parallel universes. Maybe, so there's some ideas like that. But as it is right now, for what we know right now, these two do not go together. And then the other one was evolution. Evolution, you start off with primordial muck, disorder. And out of that disorder comes order. Eventually you. Do you understand how ordered you are? You breathe, you have brain waves, you have muscles that work, you have, you have body systems that work together, you have cells that work together. You have cells that we don't even understand everything about. We start thinking we know everything about it and we discover something else. You're controlled by information DNA. DNA is like a book. Who wrote the book? Information order does not come from nothing. You can't take a bunch of letters, stir it in a pot, and get the works of William Shakespeare, can you? You cannot get, and your DNA is more complex than the works of William Shakespeare. 
You cannot stir chemicals and get information, DNA, to make you without an outside force. So there are things we don't know about this. Yay, yay. It means there are more things to learn, right? Just don't ever forget to step back and look at the big picture. Don't learn, don't learn the little picture and don't step back and look at the big picture. Because the big picture, there's some problems with our big picture. That's awesome. One of the new ones that's just kind of fun is they really discovered a new system to the body like last year. You'd think we'd know all the systems by now. But it's that you have something called a lymph system and something called um, uh, connective tissue. And they have discovered that there is a system of connective t tissue that helps lymph move through your body that they didn't know it was there. Because whenever they cut into somebody or do an autopsy or whatever, it kind of collapses where you can't see it anymore. For you to be able to see it, you had to see it in a living, functioning body that's doing what it's supposed to do, not being cut on. But we always see you being cut on. So, I mean, there is so much we don't know. Just... That's, um, I don't know. I was reading about it, probably. That's how we find things usually. <laughs> yep. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? All right. So don't be discouraged about this. Just know we got more to learn. More, more to discover. It hasn't been all discovered. There's room for you to be a great scientist and get your name in the science book. Sometimes you feel like everything's already been discovered. Nope, there are big things that haven't been discovered yet. All right, so enthalpy and entropy drive chemical reactions. This is what makes all chemical reactions happen. It's why they happen. It doesn't matter if this is in steps or all at once. These energy changes will be the same. And the guy who figured it out, that was Hess, and this is his law. So that's a nice little multiple choice question for me. Match Hess's law to what it is. And it is that it doesn't matter if these energy changes take place. And these are numbers we get. These are math problems we solve for enthalpy and entropy. And it doesn't matter if the chemical reaction does it all at once. The math turns out that the answer is the same, whether or not it was done all at once or in steps, okay? If a reaction is reversed, the sign of um, heat is also reversed. That'll make more sense when we look at the math. Okay, example problem. Diamonds and graphites are allotropes. There's another multiple choice question. What's an allotrope? An allotrope have the same that should be an M, not same. Same chemical carbon in different forms. And y'all have heard that before, haven't you? That graphite and diamonds are the same thing. Their chemical bonds are just different. Graphite, the chemical bonds are all uh, horizontal. With diamonds, there are some chemical bonds going vertically too. And that's why your pencil lead, your pencil lead is graphite. It's not really lead. If it was, if you licked your pencil, you'd get dumber because lead gives you brain damage. It's not really lead at all. It's called lead because if you take lead and rub it on a pencil, uh, a piece of paper, it makes a mark. And if you take graphite and rub it on a piece of paper, it makes a mark. Y'all know that, right? So your pencil really doesn't have lead. We just call it lead. Okay, so you can burn a diamond and turn it into graphite. Remember, we saw that in our video. Julia Childs did it. Or you can add energy to graphite and make it a diamond. How much? The enthalpies of graphite, so here's our numbers. Let's pull that up. Um, the enthalpies of graphite is negative 394 kilojoules per mole, and diamond is negative 396 kilojoules per mole. Um, so you can change graphite to diamond, but you do it in steps, okay? And here are the steps. Let me see. I don't think I have these numbers written down, and I don't want to bother doing it. Hold on a second. Let me look here. I wonder if I have it in the other video. Okay, I'm going to pause this while I go look for my math. Hold on.